fair hair lowered himself down the last few feet of rock and began to pick his way towards the lagoon. Though he'd taken off his school sweater and trailed it now from one hand, his grey shirt stuck to him and his hair was plastered to his forehead. All round him, the long scar smashed into the jungle was a bath of heat. He was clambering heavily among the creepers and broken trunks when a bird... A vision of red and yellow flashed upwards with a witch-like cry, and this cry was echoed by another. Hi, it said. Wait a minute. The undergrowth at the side of the scar was shaken, and a multitude of raindrops fell pattering. Wait a minute, the voice said. I got caught up. This is the opening of William Golding's Lord of the Flies, and if you're watching this video then it almost certainly means that you're studying this book for an exam, and if that is true, then I'm going to tell you that your teacher has chosen well. Lord of the Flies is probably the best book ever written, not only because of the story and the richness of the language, but also because of the meaning and the layers of meaning in the text. In this sequence of videos, I'm mostly going to assume that you've read the whole book and are therefore revising or refreshing your knowledge of it, although I won't be giving anything away which would ruin the ending in case you haven't got there quite yet. I'm going to be using the 1997 Faber edition for all the page references, which is the one with this front cover, although, as you'll see, I've copied various extracts into this video for you, so you should be able to find your way around whichever copy of the book you're using. I think these videos will be useful if you've missed a lesson too and need to catch up with a particular section, or if you just want to get ahead of the game and make yourself sound smart in front of your classmates. So, let's get to it. Golding uses, as the backdrop to his story, an imagined Third World War. Schools have been evacuated and taken to an airport where they'll be flown to safety. Unfortunately, one group of evacuated, mostly public school boys, are attacked during their flight and they crash land on an island in the Pacific Ocean. And to make matters worse, there is a storm when the plane crashes. The pilots are killed, as are a number of the boys on the plane, but a lot of them survive, and the novel tells the story of what happens to them. The first two characters we meet in the story are Ralph and a fat boy, whom we will come to know as Piggy. Piggy is calling out to Ralph, asking him to slow down, and this establishes an important precedent in the book, Piggy saying something perfectly sensible and no one listening to him. But even at this early stage, Golding includes some really interesting subtleties, like the witch-like cry of the startled bird, which cleverly juxtaposes the beauty which exists on the island with something a lot more frightening. This opening is also useful in introducing one of the most enduring symbols in the novel, that of the scar. Now, the scar is the U-shaped trough dug out by the fuselage of the crash-landed plane, but symbolically it's the first of many acts of violence and destruction the boys will inflict upon the island. An important theme in the novel is that of division, and we'll see later how the mountain, which is such an important feature on the island, becomes divided in two, and I'll talk in a later video about how the theme of division appears throughout the novel. But for now, it's enough to say that the scar is the first of these divisions, ripping through the island and dividing it in two. Piggy is quickly established as an intelligent character, whose role in the first chapter is also to fill in some of the gaps in the narrative. So it's from him we learn that the boys were uh, on a plane which was attacked and crash-landed on the island before the fuselage, uh, which is what created the scar, uh, was carried out to sea. Later on in the chapter, we also learn from him that the airport they flew out of has been destroyed by an atom bomb, and so there'll be nobody left alive who knew where they were meant to be going. This section of the story here creates quite an interesting baseline with which to judge how Ralph develops and matures during the novel. It also provides the reader with a, a contrast between Ralph's innocent optimism when talking about the pilot 
he'll be back all right. With Piggy's more pragmatic realism, he shook his head. Piggy's intelligence is also shown in his awareness during the beginning of this chapter that it's the fruit which he's been gorging on in the forest which have already given him a nasty case of diarrhoea. Piggy also knows that the best course of action is to find the other survivors and there are other more significant examples of his intelligence which we'll come to in just a moment. Despite this though, Piggy is ill-suited for life on the island. He's fat, he can't swim, he has asthma and he's very short-sighted. I've made a list here of some of the main differences between these two important characters as set up in the first chapter. So let's just turn our attention to uh, Ralph for a moment. At uh, 12 years old, uh, he's one of the older boys to have landed on the island, and his description is easily noted as being the complete opposite of Piggy, which I've just illustrated on the previous slide. He's attractive and athletic. Golding even says that he might make a boxer, and he repeatedly stands on his head. I've chosen this extract as the first time that Golding gives us a physical description of Ralph, and it's worth noting the mildness about his mouth and eyes that proclaimed no devil. Ralph is innocent, kind and essentially good. And the distinction between him and a devil is one of a number of early indications that this novel is going to be thematically concerned with the nature of good and evil. As well as these significant characters, Golding also establishes a number of really significant locations. And the one that we see in chapter one is the beach. And the extract I've chosen here beautifully fulfills our expectations of a paradise island. The shore was fledged with palm trees. These stood or leaned or reclined against the light and their green feathers were a hundred feet in the air. The ground beneath them was a bank covered with coarse grass, torn everywhere by the upheavals of fallen trees, scattered with decaying coconuts and palm saplings. Behind this was the darkness of the forest proper and the open space of the scar. Ralph stood one hand against a grey trunk and screwed up his eyes against the shimmering water. Out there, perhaps a mile away, the white surf flinked on a coral reef and beyond that the open sea was dark blue. Within the irregular arc of coral, the lagoon was still as a mountain lake blue of all shades and shadowy green and purple. The beach between the palm terrace and the water was a thin stick, endless apparently, for to Ralph's left the perspectives of palm and beach and water drew to a point at infinity, and always, almost visible, was the heat. So, the island has palm trees and coral reefs and lagoons, and there's a relaxed atmosphere created through the personification of palm trees which stood or leaned or reclined. But there are subtle suggestions of something else going on here as well. The palm saplings are juxtaposed with decaying coconuts, a neat symbol of life and death, while beyond them is the darkness of the forest and the open space of the scar. Now we know that in literature, darkness is thematically connected to evil or a threat of some kind and will often foreshadow something bad happening. Well, in Lord of the Flies, darkness is unavoidable. The boys are on an uninhabited island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And at night, the younger boys in particular will experience a fear which will eventually destroy their fragile society. The beach is significant as a location because of its association with Ralph. Of all the boys, he is the one most obviously enamoured with the idea of being on a paradise island, and his association with the conch, which we'll deal with in a moment, the huts as well as the place of assembly, all work together to symbolically represent a civilised society. 
The discovery of the conch is the opening's most significant moment and provides us with the title of the chapter, The Sound of the Shell. Piggy's been trying to motivate Ralph into some sort of action and has repeatedly been saying we got to do something. His second attempt is quickly followed by Ralph first ignoring, then interrupting him to point at the shell in the lagoon. It is Piggy who knows exactly what the conch is. It's a shell. I've seen one like that before on someone's back wall. A conch, he called it. He knows how valuable the conch is, and not just in monetary terms. Because on the next page, we see that it is also Piggy who recognises that this is the solution to the question of how to get all of the evacuated boys together. We can use this to call the others have a meeting. They'll come when they hear us. But what is possibly more noteworthy about this incident is the fact that Piggy then donates the credit for this idea to Ralph when he says, that was what you meant, didn't you? That's why you got the conch out of the water. In truth, this is not true at all. This is not the reason why Ralph got the conch out of the water, as revealed by his superficial evaluation of it being interesting, pretty and a worthy plaything. But like so many other things, Piggy is unable to use the conch himself due to his, well, one of his, one of his many physical disabilities this time is asthma. And so Piggy is denied all the status and power which the conch initially bestows. Soon after Ralph blows the conch, boys start arriving. And this extract, which I've taken from page 15, describes the arrival of the choir. Within the diamond haze of the beach, something dark was fumbling along. Ralph saw it first, and watched till the intentness of his gaze drew all eyes that way. Then the creature stepped from mirage onto clear sand, and they saw that the darkness was not all shadow, but mostly clothing. The creature was a party of boys, marching approximately in step in two parallel lines, and dressed in strangely eccentric clothing, shorts, shirts and different garments they carried in their hands, but each boy wore a square black cap with a silver badge on it. Their bodies from throat to ankle were hidden by black cloaks which bore a long silver cross on the left breast, and each neck was finished off with a ham bone frill. The heat of the tropics, the descent the search for food and now this sweaty march along the blazing beach had given them the complexions of newly washed plums. The boy who controlled them was dressed in the same way, though his cap badge was golden. When his party was about ten yards from the platform, he shouted an order and they halted, gasping, sweating, swaying in the fierce light. The boy himself came forward, vaulted onto the platform with his cloak flying and peered into what to him was almost complete darkness. The most significant member of this group of boys is undoubtedly Jack Meridew. Jack is the leader of the choir and his introduction, together with the rest of the choir boys, is first described as I've highlighted here, something dark fumbling along, followed closely by the word creature, which just has sinister and ominous connotations. And it links with some of the other sinister subtleties mentioned earlier in this video and certainly foreshadows later events as well. Jack is a bully and his sadistic side is evidenced by the fact that he's making the other members of the choir march along in the blazing heat still wearing their gowns. Golding describes Jack in terms which strike an easy contrast with Ralph. He is tall, thin and bony, with red hair and a face which is crumpled and freckled and ugly without silliness. He expects to find an adult when he confidently vaults onto the platform and when he finds only Ralph there we see his light blue eyes frustrated 
and turning or ready to turn to anger. Jack is arrogant and very short-tempered. He shouts at the rest of the choir, stand still, despite their protests in the heat, but Mary Dew, please Mary Dew, can't we? And rather than having any sympathy when one of them faints, Jack responds with ridicule and mockery. He's always throwing a faint. This is an early indication of the sort of boy that Jack Meridue is. Yet, despite this, soon after he appears in the novel, Ralph forgets the confidence that Piggy had entrusted him with. And in response to Jack's aggressive name-calling of Fatty, Ralph responds with, He's not Fatty, his real name's Piggy. The impact of this is immediate and worth pointing out, as it will be a feature of the way the boys interact with each other. At moments of crises, it is a joke at the expense of Piggy, which can often bring them back together. Now, there is no crisis here, but there is an isolation surrounding Piggy which will stay with him throughout. A storm of laughter arose, and even the tiniest child joined in. For the moment, the boys were a closed circuit of sympathy with Piggy outside. Other characters who appear after hearing the conch are a pair of twins called Sam and Eric, Simon, who is the choir boy who fainted, and Roger, who is ominously described on page 17 as a slight, furtive boy whom no one knew, who kept to himself with an inner intensity of avoidance and secrecy. And the idea to vote for chief comes from this unlikely source. Roger suggests it, and there'll be a lot more to say about him later. At the moment, however, it will suffice to say that his furtiveness and sense of avoidance and secrecy are as equally significant as Jack's brash confidence. Now, when they start to discuss this idea of voting for chief, um, well, Jack is the most natural leader. And Golding even points this out. The most obvious leader was Jack, the bit that I've highlighted here. But Jack is also a bully and is intimidating. Piggy doesn't ask any names when Jack arrives. And Jack is exactly the sort of person who would have bullied Piggy. He's also incredibly arrogant I ought to be chief, said Jack. And in a strange way, he might be right. I mean, he's the only one with any actual leadership experience, and certainly the others would do as he says. But Golding is also clear to point out that what intelligence had been traceable to Piggy. In other words, however unlikely a leadership candidate he might be, Piggy has been responsible for everything good that's happened since the crash so far. He recognised the conch, he knew how it could be effectively used, and then he took the logical step of taking names. Ralph, on the other hand, has no leadership experience and has shown none of the realistic pragmatism or need for action that Piggy has. Yet he is the one who is successful, and in this passage, Golding explains why. And it's a classic case of style over substance that is as relevant then as in modern politics today. Ralph simply looks the part. Uh, there, was a, there was his size and his attractive appearance. And most obscurely, yet most powerfully, there was the conch and so with Ralph, there is a connection to the adult world, which the group of boys will long for throughout the story. The conch reminds the boys of the man with the megaphone who had directed them at the airport during the evacuation. So Ralph is quickly associated with a sense of rescue and safety. And those are the dominant features associated with the world of adults at this point in the novel. What's interesting is the way that over time, being associated with an adult carries much more negative associations. 
When Jack fails to become chief and Ralph is elected instead, Jack is devastated. This is probably the first time that Jack has failed at anything. He goes red in the face, thinks about arguing about it before changing his mind. And Ralph then makes the first important political decision. He allows Jack to be leader of the choir, and in order to increase their status in the minds of the rest of the boys, their title is changed from choir boys to hunters. It's quite important to notice that at this point in the novel, Jack and Ralph are friends. Ralph sees that he has a lot in common with Jack, certainly more than he has in common with Piggy. So when he decides to go on an expedition to make sure that they are in fact on an island, Jack is the first person he chooses to go with him. The choice of Simon as the second person is a little harder to understand since he's only just recovered from his faint. Piggy begins to say that He'll come along as well, but is interrupted by Jack producing a large knife, which he clouts into a tree. And despite this deliberate piece of intimidation, Piggy persists, so that he ends up experiencing rejection on two levels. First, by Ralph, who quite correctly tells him that he'll be no good on a job like this. And then by Jack, who flatly tells him, we don't want you. Piggy begins following the three of them anyway, so that Ralph is forced to turn back and tell him again, you can't come. And now we see the full extent of Piggy's upset. He's been humiliated by Jack's rudeness, Ralph's rejection of him in favour of Jack, and also the fact that Ralph revealed to all the other boys the nickname which Piggy had entrusted to him at the beginning of the chapter. Piggy, it seems, is destined to remain Piggy, whether in the playground or the Pacific. <laughs>